Next, we're in Centerville, Michigan, for a Zoom court hearing. Judge Jeffrey Middleton has many people to hear from today, including Nathaniel Saxon, who's appearing on a drug paraphernalia charge. Two weeks earlier, police found a syringe containing methamphetamine residue in Saxon's truck during a traffic stop. Saxon's facing a possible 90 days in jail and a $500 fine. And he's not exactly getting off on the right foot with the judge. Then we'll bring this fool in. From the moment Saxon logged in, the judge noticed something he didn't particularly care for. The obscene screen name. Good morning, sir. What's your name? Me? Yeah, you. Yes. Nathaniel Saxon, sir. Your name's not but 3000, you yo-ho. Logging into my court with that as your screen name. What kind of idiot logs into court like that? Saxon looks confused and horrified. What's your name again? Nathaniel Saxton, sir, but I don't believe that I typed anything like that in. Well, that's what it says. Saxon quickly fixes his name but not soon enough to avoid a reprimand from the judge. I'll put you in the waiting room. You can sit in limbo for a while and think about what you call yourself online. A few moments later, the judge lets Saxon back in, and it appears he's gotten to the bottom of the screen name mystery. Your Honor? Yes? If, if, I, if, if I may explain. Uh, my sister was one that set up my, my Zoom account or whatever. Um, that but ever um, is my iPhone uh, pairing name for my Bluetooth speaker, sir. It's an uh, insight joke. Um, it's not what you think. I, I'm, 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 I'm embarrassed. I'm sorry. Well, you should be. All right, we'll come back to you in a bit. 20 minutes later, Saxon pled guilty to possession of drug paraphernalia and agreed to pay a $200 fine. Judge Middleton told him he was lucky to have escaped the day's events without a contempt of court charge for that screen name. Your name's not... Uh, it is this, that, and the other radio show. We are simulcasting here all the way to St. Joe County, Michigan. And I'm going to bring in our guest. That clip that you saw there was the one and only that got on everybody's radar. And now, uh, I mean, there are shows on A&E just around court appearances with uh, the pandemic coming up uh, on three-year anniversary. It started this whole revolution of Zoom courts. And my next guest is a rock star of Zoom Court. I've been uh, hitting him up for uh, two years and a few months, and he finally agreed to come on the show. It looks like he's still in the waiting room. He hasn't left, so that's a good sign. Uh, I bring you the Honorable Judge Middleton from uh, 3B, St. Joe County Circuit Court Judge. Uh, Your Honor, how are you doing today? Good afternoon. I'm doing fine, 72 degrees and sunny here in Michigan. I'm a district court judge. District, gotcha. I don't want to offend our circuit judge. But yes, <laughs> 3B district court here in St. Joe County, Michigan is where I serve. Right on. Well, I appreciate you coming on. And uh, you and a lot of other judges got on everybody's radar due to 
the fact that the pandemic uh, disallowed people from going anywhere, including court cases, and you guys had to find a way to uh, still adjudicate the law and deal with uh, plaintiffs and defendants and uh, deal with, uh, you know, just handling these court cases. Do you know where the whole concept of, hey, let's use this Zoom well, program? They've been promoting it. Different private companies and others had had remote court companies and programs available, but the Michigan Supreme Court had bought Zoom licenses for all the courts, thinking maybe they would try to get people to utilize this. Well, the pandemic hit and uh, things were shut down pretty much completely in April of 2020. Uh, we weren't holding court. No one was doing jury trials. People weren't coming in live. And so the Supreme Court had these Zoom licenses, and we were all instructed to set up a Zoom uh, court. And so I have a YouTube channel in my name, the Jeffrey Middleton YouTube channel. We started to live stream all of our court proceedings. And so little by little, we started to get back into it. And people weren't familiar with it, so we had lots of mistakes. Um, and that video clip that you had there went viral, and it was sort of the Wild West days of Zoom court. Sure. I wasn't very good at it. Uh, we had, and I don't have any help. It's just me. I don't have a clerk. I don't have a technician that does this. I'm juggling all the balls at the same time. So I had a bunch of people in there in pretrials, and this guy comes in, and I couldn't tell at first whether he did it just to go viral or he really didn't seem to know what was going on. The look on his face really does show surprise. Sure. Uh, apparently there's a hip hop song that's got something close to that in it. And I don't know what kind of trick his sister played on it, but uh, <laughs> so he got in trouble later for some other things. But uh, in that case, I just gave him a $200 fine and, I think I said, go and sin no more or something, but I didn't handle it very well. I would do better now. One of the problems with the program is you can't change their name until you bring them into the court. Okay. So they can't, uh, well, you have to bring them in, oops, wrong way, uh, before you can change their name. And so then people were doing this. And in the early days, we left the chat on. There's a chat figure a feature that goes with YouTube. And I never even looked at it. In fact, I didn't know if four people were looking at this or six or whatever, but we were told we had to live stream everything. And the chat, people would comment. Uh, it's like, oh, thank you for letting us watch this. Um, uh it's interesting. Or then someone would say, you know, show us your boobs, that sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, or yeah. IP2, some different organizations started saying stuff. And it was like, you know, it, again, the Wild West. But I wasn't even looking at it. I didn't know people were watching it or commenting on it. There was an earlier case that went viral where a man was in his girlfriend's apartment. He wasn't supposed to be there. And uh, prosecutor Dave Marvin was aware of it and he was watching it. And anyway, the guy was found out and I had him turn his, anyway, we figured out he was there and the cops came in and arrested him. Well, that went viral and it was on the front page of Reddit like the next day. And all of a sudden my head, 3000 subscribers and 10,000 subscribers and 50,000 subscribers. I think it's at like 47,000 subscribers that watch the YouTube channel every day. And there are certainly judges all over the country that are live streaming stuff. And so I have local people that watch the channel to see what's going on, which is really kind of what it was about. You ought to be able to see what's going on in your community. But then people from all over the world watch it. Uh, this morning, there were people from Russia and England and Finland and Australia and Canada and many states. I let it run for a little bit in the morning and people say good morning from 
St. Louis or good morning from wherever they are. And so, like you, you're several time zones ahead of me. I have people that log in at 810 Michigan time, which is 510 California time to uh, watch the proceedings. I save them for about 30 days, so you don't have to watch it simultaneously. But there's no pretense to it. Just do what I would do if the camera wasn't turned on. Sure. And it's, it's real people and real situations and um, just, uh, oh, it's not scripted. The people certainly aren't actors. They're mostly nervous. Um, and so people like to watch it. I joke that people watch it because it helps them fall asleep. It's so boring. <laughs> people put it on at night and, and they fall asleep. But I don't know. It's pretty humbling, actually, that all these people are actually interested in um, watching this every day. Yeah. Then, um, well, you know, myself included, I'm a I'm a court TV show junkie. Uh, I like, I, you know, like a lot of the uh, shows like the Judge Judy and uh, People's Court and stuff like that. And, and you're doing real, you know, those are supposedly real cases, although, you know, some of those have been debunked. Uh, have you been hit up to possibly be a TV judge or is that something you would like to do? And what are your thoughts on the Judge Judy's and People Court, People's Court of the Worlds? Um, well, Judge Judy makes $44 million a year <laughs> yeah. in syndication. I told my wife, I said, I would do it for half that. Um, no, no one's asked me to do a show and I'm not auditioning for a show and I'm uh, just doing our court. I don't like those very well because they're chopped up in the advertisements and they're mean to people. Um, then they don't have to be. Um, I don't really watch any. Apparently, they're popular. There's a lot of them, but no one's asked me to do one. I think I'm too old, and they think I should cut my hair. I don't know, but uh, I just do my own court every day. Uh, we start at 8, and we finish at 5, and uh, do whatever comes in. Uh, but I would, if someone offered me 44 million, I probably would accept it. Would consider it. Yeah. Um, out of the pandemic, the zoom licenses, you guys pivoted to do court cases. Do you think it would ever go in that direction had there not been a pandemic? And the follow-up to that is, is now that there isn't a pandemic in theory, um, you know, why do you continue to still do the, the zoom, uh, courts? All good questions. It would have maybe eventually happened. There were some programs called Go to Meeting and some other things they were trying to sell them. But it's transformed the practice of law in Michigan and elsewhere. Uh, for example, some cases are perfectly adapted to Zoom. Uh, you've got a civil complaint where someone's suing somebody for $24,000 and You've got a lawyer on one side in Grand Rapids and a lawyer on the other side in Bloomfield Hills. And I'm here in Centerville. Well, we can do that thing in 10 minutes by Zoom. They don't have to drive here. They don't have to file an appearance. It's completely suited to that sort of thing where you've got competent users on both sides. Uh, it's civil. Um, it, and the lawyers, really, now they can be five places at once. Um, when they had to send somebody from Bloomfield Hills to Centerville, it took several hours here and several hours back. Now, if I say it starts at nine, it starts at nine. We try to start right on the tick. And so in landlord tenant court, it's very convenient for the lawyers. It isn't necessarily convenient for non-lawyers. Although people are certainly getting better at it in the early days it was terrible. The people couldn't get their sound turned on and they couldn't get their name on there. And they were zooming in from the port of John at work or <laughs> drive while driving their car or yeah, with, with a, a suspended blunt, license. Yeah. With a blunt in their mouth and you know, that sort of thing. But people have gotten more accustomed to it and uh, much more comfortable with it. Many people just use their cell phone, which isn't ideal, but um, we, so it's been very helpful and 
I don't think judges or many lawyers want to go back to have everything live. But some things still need to be live. If you're going to try a jury trial, um, we do that live in the courtroom. Generally, if something t has testimony involved where someone has to testify under oath, we not always, but we try to do those live. So we're doing more criminal things live. We do landlord tenant court remotely. We do general civil cases remotely and small claims cases remotely and some limited criminal cases. For example, if you got a traffic ticket blasting through Centerville and you went back to Las Vegas and you had to appear for your ticket, we could do that by Zoom. The officer could come in by Zoom. You could come in by Zoom and we could have that hearing remotely. And that's a benefit to people. So there are two different things going on. One is the Zoom and the using the Zoom technology to conduct court. The other part that's more controversial is broadcasting it live streamed on YouTube. Um, some judges are absolutely opposed to it. Others are in favor of it. The Michigan Supreme Court was in favor of it. But I guess our point is, at least for me, we don't do anything secretly. Um, some ladies that I know sent me a mug that says we don't do anything in the shadows, <laughs> uh, which I've said. So now certainly if there's a child witness or something like that, I don't live stream that. And I don't live stream my sobriety court treatment program. Um, it's certainly on the record and it's recorded, but I don't live stream it. But the day-to-day -day court things that we do are live streamed. So there's a balance between the public's right to know about what's going on in a public courtroom and the litigants who might not really want everybody to know they got arrested for some criminal charge and they're being uh, you know, dealt with in a little courtroom in Centerville. But um, I'm, I'm still live streaming it and people can see it and the people in the courtroom know it's live streamed. People come to visit um, from uh, all over the place. This week I or this month I had uh, two sisters. They were twins from uh, Finger Lakes area of New York. Uh, they were from Cornell. I have some uh, other sisters who are very avid followers. They've come several times to visit from California. And people have driven here from Arkansas and Georgia and Florida and Texas and uh, New York, New Jersey, uh, to come and sit in on our court sessions, which still <laughs> sort of dumb. And then they get there and it's like, this is it. It's just this guy <laughs> in this little room that looks like it is. But they're also very nice and complimentary and earnest and I tell everybody, if you do come to visit, do it in the summertime. Right. Well, Michigan is a wonderful place to visit in June, July, August, and September. Uh, the, the ladies from California are actually renting a cottage at the lake and spending part of their summer here. Um, and it helps us maybe appreciate what we have and maybe take for granted that other people uh, – think that we're lucky to have it. And I think they're right. So you almost have, and this is not a disparaging term, but you kind of have some courtroom uh, groupies, you know, rock and roll bands have groupies. And it <laughs> seems as if you've found a way to, to get your own, so to speak, and to have people come visit and watch the court process. It's um, kind of embarrassing, actually, but they're <laughs> all very nice. Yeah, sure. Um, they're all very nice and they come and they're humble and and I like to talk to them. And yeah, it's a weird phenomenon to be sure. Um, I have a Facebook fan page that I don't look at. Um, and uh, I'm aware of it. And, uh, but I don't, I don't need to want to, you know, I don't need to see that. So sure, sure. Um, you get a big head, but you have to, one of the reasons that you need to, keep your humility is 
judges are supposed to ultimately be humble. And once you lose your humility, you can get in the woods. So I don't, you know, I do appreciate that, the fact that people like it and people watch it and people say hello in the morning. Uh, but I'm not making $22 million. I get zero. There's no money from uh, you, YouTube apparently makes money because they run oh, ads yeah. in it. But we gotcha. don't. You, yeah. you, can't, you can't monetize that? I mean, I, I guess it would, there might be a conflict there. Oh, but... there'd be all kinds of problems. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Gotcha. In Michigan, if you receive a gift over one hundred dollars, you have to report it. Gotcha. And, gotcha. And people have sent me nice things, um, very you know, real nice letters from people. And somebody sent me a bobblehead doll of me that they had made. And some of uh, these people, these friends, have sent me these very nice mugs that they made, and they sent to all the attorneys. Someone from Arizona sent me a plant. Someone sent me a nice coat hanger that they made that says Judge Jeffrey C. Middleton. Uh, somebody sent me a little calendar. Um, people have sent me like their AA coins. Um, so I reported it all to the Supreme Court, and it's like that doesn't count. But I tell people, stop sending me stuff. <laughs> right. Um, but they're very nice. They're very nice. And um, Someone sent me some M and M's with legal sayings on it, ah. um, like "not guilty" or uh, I don't even know what I was on all of them. He had them made somehow, so there it's nice, and the people are nice. And um, when the people were on the live stream saying inappropriate stuff, we shut it off, and uh, and that's probably for the best. So I'm not sure how I came to the attention of a rock and roll radio show. You had asked me <laughs> several times, and you were very diligent. Because at first, when all this was going on, it was kind of like a circus. And I yeah. said, you know, no, thank you. I appreciate your diligence. And then you kept asking, and things have calmed down, and people have gotten more uh, acclimated to, to YouTube and Zoom and Zoom courts. And as you said, you know, there are all these shows on television. My next door neighbor, he watches those every day yeah. and enjoys it. I, there's too many commercials in there. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. You got to DVR I, you know, it. I don't want to watch that on a show. It's like I do that all day for real. So right. <laughs> Exactly. Well, it's the same thing for me. I don't listen to a lot. Of, I mean, I do listen to a lot of music as a musician, but uh, I listen to a lot of talk radio and, and watch shows with my wife and stuff like that because – after you get done rehearsing for a few hours or playing a tour for two weeks and you come home, the last thing you want to do is put on loud music. Uh, let me ask you some questions about um, the law a little bit and the Zoom court, because you kind of mentioned there are certain cases that make sense to have attorneys and people that live out of state to do that. But I always felt like, and I feel like in this country, and you know, we take the politics out of it, but there's a lot of things now that are civil infractions where, you know, you used to have to go in front of the judge. You used to have to go to the principal's office to answer to what you did. Do you think it's a little bit of, uh, you know, kind of skating around the law to not go there? Because I got to tell you, I, I'm, you know, I'm a little nervous in front of you. and We're just doing a radio show here. Uh, had I committed a crime and I'm in front of you as a defendant, I, f I feel like it forced people to really perhaps own up a little bit more than if they're just in their room, you know, with no shirt on smoking the blunt and their BF or 3000 logo on the, on the screen. I mean, do, do you think that it's kind of allowing people some, some slack? Yes, it is. And that's a, a, a very valid point. Some of the judges are very opposed to it because it takes away the solemnity of the process that maybe it shouldn't be convenient, that you should have to go to court and you should have to deal with a judge. I don't think I scare people, but people are nervous when they come to court. They often cry. We have Kleenexes there and people often cry because it can be emotional. Um, but it's much less gravitas to do it remotely than it is to come in and sit down and look the judge in the eye. So our daily arraignments, the people come in and they stand at the podium and I, I'm 20 feet away and uh, can talk with them. But that was a big negative and still is a negative with a lot of older judges that it took away the 
I'll use the word again, solemnity of the pro proceeding. But the world is changing. Uh, we're not going to go backwards, and the new people using courts are going to expect uh, to be able to do it by Zoom. I had someone the other day that was complaining about it, and I said, well, you could come here. Uh, uh, you could come in here, drive over here, sit down, and wait your turn until I talk to you, uh, like we used to do. Um, so, yeah, you hit a very valid point. I started here in 1980 uh, as a young assistant prosecutor, and I was in the prosecutor's office from 1980 to 2003. So for 23 years, I practiced on the other side of the bench and there was more decorum and there was more dignity and everything was done in person. I tried lots of cases in front of different judges and, um, and that was a good learning experience, but young lawyers won't be doing that. Not in that same manner. They'll be appearing by zoom. They don't try as many cases as they used to try. Um, it's just a different world and I'm trying not to dinosaur my way out be some old curmudgeon that says this you know we used to do it like this back in my day back and when i'd say it too much now if you talk to my lawyers they probably like there he goes again um and um but so i tr i try to adapt and i find myself sometimes realizing how out of it i am maybe you get this maybe you won't i expect that you will but I had someone in court named McAllister, and I said, Billy Joe McAllister jumped off the Tallahatchie Bridge. And he looked at me like I was from outer space. And uh, everybody that's my age would get that reference. It's from the Bobby Gentry song, Ode to Billy Joe. Um, and uh, so, but he didn't know what I was talking about. So I was like, well, there I go again. And so that happens to me more and more. But now I just don't care. I'll say things that maybe people will get or maybe they won't. I had a Mexican lady to the name was Carolina. And I asked her if she knew the James Taylor song Carolina in my mind. And she had no clue what I was talking about. And there was a language barrier, too. So I think I just embarrassed her, but um, it makes my life more interesting. Well, that was something that attracted me to wanting to have you on the show is, you know, you'll start start your streams and I'll hear you humming, you know, an Eagles tune or something. So I know you're a classic rocker and uh, and you appreciate the, the good stuff from, from well, back in first, the day. I didn't realize that it was on. <laughs> uh, so I would... It, you know, I turn it on and then, and so if I heard, you know, take it easy on the way in, I might be humming it or I, sometimes I play music in the courtroom before I set things up. And so I was humming my old school or something, not realizing that it was on. Now I realize it was on, but I still do it anyway. It just um, music makes your life better. Yeah, more, I agree. You more, know, more. oddly enough, before you came on as we were transitioning into this show, and by the way, my guest, uh, Judge Jeffrey Middleton from St. Joe County, uh, he is a judge that has, in my opinion, become a, a rock star of the Zoom court on YouTube. He's got a essentially a daily court proceedings. Some might say it's a daily show, but you're doing real life, real court. And uh, you're on this, that, and the other radio show here at Dirty Radio Classics. Uh, for those listening on the air. So typically, uh, Your Honor, I do a radio show, but I figured with your Zoom presence, I see it fit to, to simulcast this. But oddly enough, before you came on, uh, The Clash, I Fought the Law and the Law One was the song that transmitted. I'm like, you can't make this stuff up. Uh, you, you've been in the business since the 80s, and uh, you're on the hook right now in your current term until 2026. Uh, how much... How, how much longer are you going to go? You see another term after that? I can't go longer than that. Ah, okay. uh, in Michigan, you can't be elected after your 70th birthday. And so uh, I'll be 71 at that point. Um, I was what's, in the wa what's in the water out there? You look great. I never would have guessed that. I get that a lot. I don't know. It's, it's starting to catch up with me. 
Mm -hmm. um, when I was running for judge, I was in my 40s and little old ladies thought I was 21. But uh, one day it'll all hit me all at once and I'll look like the picture <laughs> of Dorian Gray after they ripped it. <laughs> um, but anyway, no, I can't serve anymore after that. So uh, that would be 40 six years and that's probably long enough it's a lot of well, a lot of some service people probably think it's long enough already but <laughs> um i know the people and i had or their parents and their grandparents and i've been here long enough now that almost everybody that comes in there, there he goes again i had a guy yesterday i knew his dad and his aunt and uh, that's very common that um I'm seeing the third generation of people that started coming in here with problems. Um, but at least I'm constant. <laughs> I've, been, I've been here longer than anyone else um, that's currently here and almost longer than anybody ever was. By the time I'm done, I'll be here longer than anybody ever was. Um, plans? Plans after uh, 2026? Um, you know, I guess people ask me. I don't know. I have grandchildren. As you know, I was just on a trip to Key West. Uh, I went to Bocas del Toro in Panama in January. Uh, I'd like to be able to do more of that. Uh, I live on a lake. I enjoy my summers. I like to ride my bike. So maybe I'll just retire. Um, people, you know, I get two people ask me almost every day, when are you going to retire? And then the other one is, when are you going to cut your hair? And, <laughs> I say that I don't know the answer to each either one of those, but yeah. people will yell out there, get a haircut out the window. And um, that happened during COVID too. I just quit cutting my hair and then I just quit cutting my hair. Um, but no, I'll probably retire unless Judge Judy retires and they offer me 44 million to do that. <laughs> right. Um, you know, something that seems to, to get under your skin a little bit, and I think everybody's, and we see these videos of these, uh, maybe you can kind of explain it from your end, uh, the sovereign citizen movement. Re really, I, I don't know that anybody really knows what that's about. And it, what, what are your thoughts, uh, if you well, can have like an impartial opinion? They're very popular on YouTube. People like yeah. to mock them or make fun of them. Uh, it's a philosophy that somehow the law does not apply to them. And it's very, the people that are actually doing, that are coming into court, somebody told them this, or they bought a program off the internet, or they watched a show. Or, and the people that are selling this malarkey, they don't even believe it themselves. <laughs> right. It cites the Magna Carta and the Uniform Commercial Code and the, Treaty of Ghent and a bunch of stuff that has no legal relevance. And, and the, the offensive part of, of it is that they don't have any respect for our system, that somehow they're their own country and the law does not apply to them. I can drive because I don't subscribe to your authority. I can steal because you don't have authority over me. I can run up a large debt and not be responsible for it because I'm a sovereign citizen and I'm not responsible for it. And I thought maybe calling them sovereign citizens gave it too much dignity. So I gave it my own name and uh, I call those people Borogoves, uh, which comes from a famous poem by Lewis Carroll called Jabberwocky and mm. an old science fiction story called Mimsy where the borough goes. But I say they're speaking Jabberwocky and they're borough goes. Um, and most of them are all right. You know, they're not evil. They're misguided. And, uh, and they also waste time. They enjoy like taking up your time and sparring with the court. So I'll let them go and for a while, and then I'll just say, um, okay, you know, what you're saying doesn't is not a, apply. It doesn't affect it. And uh, I've got to adjust a, either my location or the uh, I've got a e evening sun coming in here. Yeah, no worries, no worries. Anyway, um, 
so yeah, they become quite popular. People make people making fun of them. Some are, are Moorish, and uh, and so people put a fez on and and mock it. But if you were to just <laughs> yeah. Google sovereign citizens videos, you'd see lots of them. And some are more artful than others, but some are just somebody that got duped by somebody else. Yeah, on this stuff. Uh, you know. Marijuana is becoming legal in over half the country. Do you, do you guys have that legalized there in Michigan? It's, it's legalized in Michigan. Let me ask you this. Uh, trends in crime and types of crimes. Have you noticed uh, a trend, positive or negative, since it's been legalized? I mean, what are your thoughts on it? Well, the sky didn't fall. <laughs> True. Um, now, Colorado was the first... Uh, state to pass it and everyone was waiting to see what happened but the answer is no other than we don't have a bunch of little minor marijuana cases clogging the court docket True. Um, we thought we would see it in traffic cases uh, that there would be people that would be driving while high and getting an accident we have not at least i have not seen a or my partners a groundswell of traffic accidents as a result of marijuana we had a case earlier this year that went to jury trial and the guy had a relatively low blood alcohol level and marijuana in his system and the jurors convicted him of it. Uh, the communities, the county and the cities and villages in our county that have marijuana dispensaries have made hundreds of, I think $900,000 came to St. Joe County this 2023 from dispensaries. Wow. But no, we certainly haven't seen like people that are stealing under the influence of marijuana or <laughs> domestic assault under the influence of marijuana. Our problem is alcohol yeah. and methamphetamine. Unfortunately, we are a methamphetamine jurisdiction and it undertones almost everything that happens here in the criminal arena. Um, People are struggling. It's very, very powerfully addictive. Um, and we had lots of methamphetamine cases. When I was very young, we had heroin. And it was old-fashioned black tar, junky heroin. And that went away for a long time. And then it was cocaine. And then it was crack cocaine. And I don't know if I've seen a cocaine case in a year. Mm. Now we have heroin. Well, then we had Oxycontin and all that stuff in there, which was terribly on the way Oxycontins were prescribed and people became handing them out opioid addicts. But now we're struggling with fentanyl, other opioids and methamphetamine and both people are using uh, methamphetamine to get enough ambition to go scrabble up enough money to buy more heroin. And uh, we've seen lots of fentanyl overdoses. Yeah. People don't overdose from marijuana and they don't overdose from methamphetamine. They decay. Uh, methamphetamine certainly over time just certainly destroys your physical being. Uh, but it doesn't kill you all at once like an overdose of fentanyl or other opioids would. So no one in the country has got adequate treatment for methamphetamine. A couple more questions, and uh, I'll hit you up on some music stuff. You suggested some songs for the show today, and we're going to include them. I just want to see if you want to weigh in on some thoughts on those. We'll get to those in a second. Um, we, we mentioned earlier about, uh, you know, it's happening here in, in Nevada where, you know, things that used to be a crime are now just infractions, they're tickets, it's a, you know, appear in court or pay a fine. Um, people aren't really being held accountable anymore. And in California, you know, you can rob, you know, there's a case of a gal in San Francisco that has been arrested, you know, dozens of times, has never been prosecuted, goes into the same target, has ripped them off for $40,000, but never, like they're not being held accountable in your 40 years of this business, do you, what are your thoughts on how the law has changed and how, in, from my point of view, is 
we're just not we're not doing anything about it. People are not being held accountable. They're just getting kind of kicked down the road until they do something either the same over and over and over again, or they start moving into serious stuff because, you know, if they break the window and steal the the uh, the backpack, you know, they get a slap on the wrist. Uh, it, the fine is less than the stuff that they sold after they stole it, and then just go do it again. I mean, you think we're headed the wrong direction legally? I think everybody agrees with that. We haven't gotten there yet. People watch our show. I have a friend that lives in Victorville, mm. and he says, I watch it because things still work. People are held accountable if somebody does something it's charged, you deal with it, the case is processed. We aren't at the Wild West. But the reason for having the law in the first place is to keep people from just seeking their own retribution. If someone mm -hmm. breaks your car window and steals your backpack, if nothing's going to happen, you might as well go beat them up with a baseball bat or slash their tires or shoot them. Or, uh, the public order breaks down which is part of the issue with sovereign citizens. It's important to have public order and public accountability. And certainly things have changed. When I, early in my career, I know a guy who went to prison for stealing some meat out of somebody's freezer in their garage. Um, now you'd get a fine and a probation, if even that. Well, in the back in the day, you went to prison for that. Yeah. So I'm not, you know, going back to the bad old days where people went to prison for minor things. Plus, it was not just here, but universally probably unfairly applied to people of color and people with no money, which arguably it still is. Um, if you have no money, the uh, world looks different to you than it does if you're wealthy. If you're growing up in an inner city neighborhood, the world looks different to you than it does from somebody who lives in Bloomfield Hills. If you're Mexican, you don't speak English, and you're here either lawfully or unlawfully, um, things look different than someone that's lived here all their life. So you try to take that into account. But yes, ultimately, everything will break down if there's not some sort of accountability or some sort of competent legal system for everything. For a lawsuit, if someone rips you off on a sale of something and you want recompense, the solution isn't to go bust their windows out with a baseball bat. You file an action and the judge will order that they pay up. Or in a landlord-tenant situation, um, if you're a landlord and you can't get the tenant out of your property, um, you need a court order and there's a lawful way to do it. And so it is cumbersome. Maybe it's less satisfying than going and busting somebody's <laughs> windows out with a baseball bat. Yeah. But I'd like to think that there is some accountability still left here in my county. And we try to not be onerous. And, you know, I get like, you should have thrown that guy in jail. Well, there are a lot of factors that go into that. One is a statute that presumes you won't put people in jail, which is relatively new. And you're right. The legislatures have changed the law to make things. Well, for example, they decriminalize marijuana or they change the law on expungement so things can be taken off of your record. They change the law on pretrial release so people are entitled to bail that maybe they wouldn't have been previously. They changed the law as to sentencing, that there is a presumption that there won't be a jail sentence. They changed the law as to probation and what you can do when someone violates probation. So the way it works, I don't make the law. Somebody else does, and that's the legislature. So they make the law and the judge enforces it. So I don't have to like it or agree with it, but I have to follow it. Gotcha. If, I don't, if I don't like it, I guess I could go do something else, uh, fish off a bridge or <laughs> watch court TV all day. Right. But, um, so I'm not a judge, jury, and executioner. I'm just a judge. And uh, I try to follow the law. And if the prosecutor charges somebody with a crime and it comes to my attention, 
Uh, you deal with them one way before they're convicted because they're presumed to be innocent. If they are convicted, then you have to deal with sentence and consequences of what happened. So it's part of the job. It took me a while to finally see how it all fit together. But after 42 years, I think I've got a sense of it. Thoughts on, uh, last question about the law, uh, on plea deals. I always have a hard time. I never understand. My, my wife is in law enforcement. And, you know, one of the battles that uh, the people she works with is, you know, they, they arrest the same people over and over for the same stuff. And they get, you know, things get pled down. And I never understood that because I'm like, well, isn't the court in business of being a court? It's not like it's a hamburger stand and they're being asked to do something that they don't do and they just ad lib and make it happen. I mean, that's why the courts are there. And then, you know, so somebody goes out and does something drastic and they're just, you know, getting a small fine, getting some probation and they're not really serving any time. And then it again, puts them right back out. Doing there is the that. It's certainly a factor with methamphetamine. I don't make the charge. The prosecutor yeah. does. And plea bargains and plea reductions are a function of the prosecutor, not the judge. Gotcha. So if someone is charged with breaking and entering a house, that's a felony punishable by up to 10 years imprisonment or 15. And if the prosecutor reduces that to illegal entry, that's a 93-day misdemeanor. That's what I have to deal with. And I've seen cases where I didn't agree with the prosecutor's plea agreement, but I used to be the prosecutor. Mm. And you have to presume that the prosecutor knows more than you do about their case. Maybe the victim isn't cooperative. Maybe they've gone back to Tierra del Fuego. Maybe um, there's something else that you don't know. And, and so the, the prosecutor makes the charge the prosecutor has authority to reduce the charge. The judge doesn't. So that's an important distinction. And so um, that's not an easy job. I can attest. I used to do it. But we used to try lots of cases. I tried 107 felony trials in my career as a prosecutor. And I don't know, dozens of misdemeanor jury trials. They haven't, in the last five years, they haven't tried 10 cases, probably all together, maybe a dozen. So it's a different world. And, um, and I just have to live in it and try to adapt. Gotcha. Well, I appreciate you getting into all that stuff, especially after uh, a long, illustrious career talking and, and, and uh, adjudicating law. Uh, you sent me some songs for the show. We're going to sprinkle them out through the next uh, two hours of the show. Uh, I've got uh, Judge Middleton from St. Joe County, Michigan. He is uh, one of the Zoom uh, judges that's been on for the past three years at the start of the pandemic and still does it. He's got his own channel and has uh, daily cases that you can watch uh, like any of the other court shows, but uh, with a little bit more reality. And uh, he's also a classic rocker. And uh, he is on this, that, and the other radio show here at Dirty Radio FM Channel Two, Dirty Radio Classics. You gave me a couple songs here: um, Bob Seger, Silver Bullet Band, Night Moves. Uh, any thoughts on on why? Because I asked you, I said, "Hey, give me a, give me a handful of songs." You gave well, me five. Bob Seger is obviously a Michigan guy. Sure, yeah, Detroit. Yeah. My age, Bob Seger would play at your prom or your after school dance. They don't have high school dances with live bands anymore, but. 50 years ago, you had a live band. Yeah. And Bob Seeger was the live band at People's Stuff. Anyway, he talks about things that I lived through. And anyway, the live version of Night Moves talks about Southern Michigan summertime and not much better than Southern Michigan summertime. I think I gave you uh, Dire Straits. Yeah. Uh, Romeo, Romeo and Juliet. And Juliet, which is just yeah. a great song. Yeah. Mark Knopfler is a wonderful songwriter. And um, that's a good song. Um, I don't know. Rolling Stones, Far Away Eyes. Yeah, there are a lot of uh, good Rolling Stones songs. That one's off Some Girls, which is a great album. And the video for it is funny, too. They're all sitting in a little studio. and uh, But that's a great song, too, and maybe one that people don't listen to or haven't heard a lot. But that's a good song. You gave me Maggie May, uh, but the Melissa Etheridge version. Why did you choose that one? Well, 
I like female rockers too. My kids kind of made fun of me sometimes for that. That's a great cover uh, with her hoarse voice. And uh, uh, most people probably haven't heard that version of it. I got it off some bootleg record. You know, I miss all that. I used to like to go to record stores mm. and I'd score some great record. There was a Christmas record for children that originally had Santa Claus was coming to town, Bruce Springsteen's cover. Yeah. You couldn't just buy it. I found that in a record store in Canada. I thought I'd won the lotto. <laughs> and then uh, when C you know CDs came out and you could go to UCD stores and find cool stuff or the little five plex things that had just a couple songs and some other now it's all live streamed and it it just seemed to take the fun out of it. But I used to enjoy cruising record stores and UCD stores and buying stuff. And my kids are all into music. They know my music a lot better than I know theirs. Um, and uh, I think that's a good thing, though. <laughs> well, they do. I mean, yeah. my kids are conversant in almost all of my stuff. They don't like Jimmy Buffett. Jimmy Buffett is like Lawrence Welk. To people that age. <laughs> yeah. But I like Jimmy Buffett. I have everything that I could find that he recorded. Uh, I grew up on James Taylor. But um, all, you know, when I was a kid, we only had two radio stations. We had WLS, which mm -hmm. is a 50,000 watt station out of Chicago, and WCFL. Yep. And everybody listened to the same songs. So you get the Rolling Stones. You'd get Linda Ronstadt, you'd get the Spinners, the OJs, uh, then some song like Kiss an Angel Good Morning or something. And there was a spectrum of music that everybody listened to the same stuff because uh, that's all there was. And so there was a commonality of it. So people my age have that secret handshake. They understand all those songs. Well, 80s have their own vibe and the 90s have theirs and I kind of got lost after about the 2010s I'm woefully out of date in current popular music hip-hop or pop music or Latin music there are people that like all of it but it kind of left me behind so I've got several hundred records and CDs <laughs> I can listen to, but I find now with Spotify, I, I do less and less of that. Yeah. But, um, like I said earlier, music makes your life better. It makes you remember things. Um, sure. People cry a lot at some concerts. They cry at Elton John concerts. They cry at Paul McCartney concerts, people my age, because when I watched the Beatles documentary on Disney Channel, um, it was, I don't know what the right word is. It was happy, sad, uh, bittersweet. It reminded me of how young they were and how young I was and how magical it was that all of a sudden they're dinking around and they come up with get back and music makes you remember where you were when you heard it. Um, I remember the first time I heard Bohemian Rhapsody in a car. That's kind of a scene out of Wayne's world, but um, it's like, what was that? What right. was that? And you couldn't just play it again. Um, you couldn't like hit rewind or, or get it on up again on YouTube or Spotify. You had to wait till it came on again. And it's like, what was that? And I got lots of those kind of memories from hearing songs in a car or in my radio in my room. And it makes you uh, remember. And uh, it also, it's universal. My grandkids like to dance. You know, they'll dance around. I, my son sent me a video of my grandson dancing to uh, Won't Get Fooled Again. Wow. Have the greatest screen in rock <laughs> and awesome. roll. Yeah, he's, he's two and a half, and he was getting down to to won't get fooled again. So, for all I like it for all those reasons, and I don't know what the future holds for people with music, whether 
today's 20 year olds are going to remember what they liked when they were 20 or yeah. everything moves so fast. It'll be just a distant memory and they won't own it. They won't have a record of whoever they like. Uh, it'll be on some different format. It won't be Spotify 50 years from now. I don't know. Maybe some implant in your brain, <laughs> but for my time and my age and the golden era we were in, in, our country in the 50s and 60s and 70s, it gives me comfort to enjoy all that music. Well, from albums to Zoom chords to musical implants in the brain, uh, <laughs> Judge Middleton, uh, I think we, we covered it all. I really appreciate your time and uh, and for not getting a restraining order on me for hitting you up over no, the past two and a half years. You've very, asked very astute and, and insightful questions, so thank you well, for that. I was going to ask you, what would be my sentence based on the quality of this interview? Straight probation. <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take it. Hey, thank you so much. And uh, and we'll continue to watch you on your YouTube channel and uh, and and on Court TV on A&E. Should you get any more BF or 3000s to show up and uh, sovereign citizens and all that good if, stuff? If I were to direct somebody that people asked this morning, what this where was this going to be? How would they access this when you're next? The uh, yeah the the best way to uh, find this will be at drummertroy.com and I also have a YouTube channel which is youtube.com forward slash drummertroy and uh, it'll it'll be there archived as soon as we stop uh, stop this recording. Now is it up live again on Saturday? So the uh, audio part of the interview uh, will be rebroadcasted on Saturday. It'll be audio only. But okay. uh, this interview that we did live here, we live streamed. We got a, uh, quite a few people watching. I got a bunch of comments. Uh, so, you know, we hit some marks here. But I think once people know that you came on and you, you kind of took the robe off and let the hair down, so to speak, and, and sort of unraveled a little bit behind the scenes of uh, court cases. And we talked some classic rock and rock and roll. I think uh, we'll get some hits on here and people will see the, the man behind the robe. <laughs> now I'm in a shadow. I look like I'm in a 60 minutes interview where they got me blanked out so they can't see my face. Anyway, I've been <laughs> talking with you. I'll tune into your show and thank you for your persistence um, and good luck to you. You've got a very interesting story. I should be interviewing you, all the, all the uh, emails we exchanged, all the things that you've had going on just this year. You lead a very interesting life as a renaissance man in 2024 <laughs> so, uh, yeah on, on occasion it's interesting for sure all right well good luck to you your honor thanks so much for coming on and uh and and talk soon take care all right thanks all right there he goes uh judge middleton i'm not going to ban him from the studio i'm going to kick him from the studio thanks so much for coming on the show uh this that and the other radio show you can tune in right now at dirtyradio.fm and uh you'll see the cassette there channel two Dirty Radio Classics. You can also find uh, the live stream happening right now, audio-wise, at drummertroy.com. There's a player there. And uh, we are going to uh, get into what uh, Judge Middleton picked for his classic rock tunes to contribute to this show. So for those of you that were on the YouTube and saw the stream with Judge Middleton, thanks for checking it out. We did see some comments in here. Let me see if there's anything of interest uh do do, do uh, wheels uh mcwheelerson there's a good name hey what's up wheels uh geeky grandma go and sin no more yeah i don't know people are going to continue to sin uh therese marie i finally found you judge middleton heard you mention you'd be on the show today oh that's cool i didn't know you did that i'll have to find that um do 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 uh so uh Therese, so when uh judge middleton watches the replay of this to see how awesome he is uh I'm reading the comments here from Therese uh, from SoCal. Try to watch you daily if I can get up early enough and say hello. Yeah, we got on the West Coast here. We got to get up at 5 a.m. to catch the start of his court case. Uh, Tom Riddle, we love Judge Middleton. I agree. Uh, I've been using it to sleep lately. <laughs> Tom Riddle says uh, Judge Middleton also likes Millie Vanilli. Interesting. And uh, he could fill the Providence spot. Don't know that one. Uh, Ask the judge about the song he is writing, One More Cigarette, One More Ceiling Fan. That's a great song, and I know the inspiration of that. Uh, maybe we'll get a follow-up interview about uh, that. I have a feeling that the cigarettes and the ceiling fans are from his Zoom courts. Uh, glad to find you too, Troy, and love the music. I heard it at the beginning, The Clash and Stevie Nicks. Yeah, 
we uh, play it all here at Dirty Radio Classics. My show for the three hours that I'm on, I do some different stuff. As you can see, it's called This, That, and the Other. Uh, Australia in the house from Pub Test. How are you? Regular Judge Middleton viewer at uh, midnight in Sydney. Uh, we love you guys down under. I'll uh, raise a VB and have some Vegemite in your honor. Uh, California sisters are some of my favorite people. Definitely groupies from Wheels McWheelerson. And uh, get on the clue bus. Yeah, that's a good one. I, I should have pulled a lot of the favorite uh, audio from uh, Judge Middleton, the things he says. But th this one here, uh, this one is a, is a pretty good one here. I love you, Yoho. That's a good one. Um, what else do we have here? Uh, do, do, do Yoho. Love the judge knows everyone coming through the court. He regularly says he knew someone as a kid. Yeah, that's one thing. Very small town there, uh, which I would think would keep people out of court because I think it'd be a little embarrassing. You want to see the judge at the store, not in the court. Um Let's just see if there's anything else here. Uh, ordered a young DUI defendant to listen to a specific song. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I, unfortunately, I wasn't uh, prepped to do. I like he does his whole Zoom show on his own. Uh, I'm doing this wacky show all on my own, for better or for worse. So, uh, listen, I'm going to tune out here of the YouTube portion of the show. I'm going to end the stream. Want to thank you all for uh, checking that out, uh, Antonio. Uh, thanks for the. Cool interview comment. I appreciate it. We should show that one. How about that? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, from Pub Test, you're welcome. Appreciate it. From Therese Marie. Look at that. Van Halen played. Van Halen played the high school. Could you imagine? How cool is that? Very, very cool. All right. Well, uh, <laughs> the only person. Look up Fez. Uh, I learned that from uh, Law Talk with uh, with Mike, and uh, he wears the fez when he does sovereign citizen cases. You know, this whole Zoom court thing inspired uh, attorneys and other people to get their own uh, TV Zoom uh, YouTube shows. So it's it's really spawned a whole uh, new sort of category of entertainment. But uh, anyway, hey, this, that, and the other radio show, Dirty Radio, Dead FM, Channel 2, Dirty Radio Classics. It is uh, Troy Patrick Farrell, and that was my guest for the first hour of this show. Coming up next, we've got uh, the Metal Babe Minute, as well as a Canadian rock spotlight with Dr. Rock. And uh, we're out of here. You guys take it easy, and thanks again for coming on the YouTube, as well as checking out the show. I'm going to send myself... Uh, I'm going to remove myself from the stage, but you guys have a good one. If you guys want to hear some good rock and roll, uh, especially brought to you directly from Judge Middleton, stay tuned in at drummertroy.com, or you can go to the radio station website, uh, dirtyradio.fm, and then click the cassette for Dirty Radio.